Good evening. Uh, thank, thank you, everybody, for being here, uh, especially with the room being hot. So, um, and I'd like to thank the Society for allowing me to uh, present here at the conference this evening. And uh, I'm a, a member of the Society for Scientific Exploration, and uh, I wanted to talk about uh, making UFO data more useful for scientific research. And uh, I, th I think, and this could apply to other fields as well, including parapsychology. So, and I, th I think this symbolizes kind of where the state of uh, working with UFO data is at the moment, uh, especially for those in the back who may not, if you can't see it real clearly enough. It's uh, these alien spaceship has landed. The two aliens get out. One says the other, "See, I told you they wouldn't notice us." You have all the, the earthlings got their heads buried in their smartphones so they can't see them. So um, I, think, I think that's with the case in a symbolic way with the UFO data. There's some things we cannot see with it because of just the, the nature of the data. And also there's just only fairly recently uh, tools that we have coming online in which we can address that. But this, we just haven't really been able to uh, employ those tools. And what I'm going to do is just a preview is I'm going to uh, just give a background on UFO data and then discuss some criticism about it, about it in regard to its scientific usefulness and also a uh, proposed method for enhancing it to address those criticisms and then uh, going into a conclusion and then uh, question and answers. So uh, as far as the background about UFO data, uh, some key characteristics is it's there's desperate sources. I mean, there's collections of UFO data all over the world, here in the United States, uh, in Britain, Europe, Asia, there, there's all kinds, all, source, all kinds of sources, government sources, uh, private researchers, non-governmental non organizations or non-profit organizations, research groups, there's all kinds of sources out there. And also there's active and non-active uh, collections of data, active as in they're currently accepting data, and non-active non means it's no longer in operation, it's archived. And the next slide that I'll get to will expound upon that more. And then another term, uh, and I've heard this term used today as well, especially in the advent of in the, the internet and Google and uh, Facebook, where we're talking about l lots of data. Uh, and um, when we describe big data, there's Commonly, it's characterized by what is known as the three Vs. There's actually more Vs, but I hear these are three common Vs. And that's high volume, variety, and velocity. And when I talk about volume in terms of computer memory size, we're talking about a zettabyte. Now, that's equivalent to one trillion gigabytes. That's a warehouse of DVDs. And that's, that's especially if you're talking about trying to pull all this UFO to data together or, or, or much of the key databases out there and trying to bring it together and work with it. Uh, and also variety. When we talk about variety, we're talking about different types of data. Some of it's struct it, it can range from structured to uh, unstructured. An example of a uh, structured data would be uh, a relational da database, like uh, maybe like a health insurance company working with uh, electronic health records. It's all organized in these nice, neat rows and columns of data uh, to uh, some of your semi-structured, which is somewhat looser data, but it might be uh, like some of the uh, hypertext markup language that's used for designing web pages uh, runs that run the internet. That's got some structure to it. To uh, to uh, unstructured data, just a loose text document like this right here. I mean, I mean, just the papers, like some of the. It's, it's got some structure to it, but if you, if, if you look at some of the UFO cases, uh, especially where, where people are reporting, they're providing a n textual narrative, and a lot of times people are typing and they're, or they're, it's being recorded down, and it's just really loose narrative. It's, it's practically like prose, so it's really unstructured data. And, um, and we talk, you know, another quality is high velocity. Big data is where the, 
a, a batch of data can be processed in a ma matter of seconds or minutes or even fractions of a second, depending on the system that's used. And then also with big data, you can't, you can't effectively analyze it with traditional databases or methods. So. And here's a, a sample of uh, some of key UFO data based in the United States. Uh, some of you, is the, you may have heard of these, like the Mutual UFO Network, MUFON Case Management System, which is active, of course. And uh, it's got over 100,000 case files. It's the, the type of data. It's structured, combined with some semi-structured data. It's, uh, they're improving it. They're making enhancements to it. Uh, it's, it functions like a relational database in a sense. It's got, and it's got some semi-structured data, textual data, links to photographs, um, even videos. And um, then there's the, these other databases and the uh, National UFO Reporting Center, which is somewhat similar to the, the MUFON one. And then you got Project Blue Book, which uh, many of you may have heard of. Uh, and that's, that's an example of a non-active database. And uh, and that's a lot. Those files they're they're even somewhat less structured than the other uh, type of databases. So, and criticism is about the usefulness of UFO data. And I think this is a key thing that's a stumbling block in UFOlogy or anybody that has an interest in researching it is is uh, the analysis is limited to case studies uh, or descriptive statistics. When I talk about limited to case studies, it's usually telling a story. This person saw such and such, such and such object in the sky on such and such date. Like Roswell, for instance, the, the UFO crash that's claimed to be at Roswell, that's an example of a case study that's been told. I, I'd, haste, I, I'd say that's, it, it runs the risk. And this, it's, it's just my observation from, from hearing it from other people, especially those in the field of UFOlogy or UFO research is that it's, it, it's the risk of becoming data, it, it, repetitious, dated over time. You got the res one researcher over here at a conference or a place talking about this, this, the case study and another one over here talking about the same case study. So it's like, what, where do we go from here? We've heard this before. What, what, what new can we learn? So, and what, what's lacking is inferential st statistics where you can... Uh, where you, where you can actually start to visualize the data, where you can act, uh, not, not just read text narratives or, or looking just at photographs, but you can start to visualize it. You can, you can uh, start to run regression and uh, comparing some means if you want to compare groups. Uh, and the other criticisms would be from a um, renowned computer scientist and UFO researcher uh, Jacques Fillet. And he talked about in da inadequate data validation, um, no really missing standards. Not to say there's no standards, but standards as far as validating the data, before you, especially before you analyze it. Uh, there's really no uh, universal or formal set of standards really established out there that I'm aware of, or, well, according to what he's saying as well. And it's a very complex phenomenon. I mean, if you, you, if you have a, somebody saying they've seen something pop out of midair and vanish, dematerialize in midair, that's hard to, uh, that's hard to physically gauge, you know, that's not following classic physics, you know, velocity, acceleration, that's, so it's that, and there's also a lack of data exchange among many UFO research groups, um, so that, that's also another challenge. So um, a proposed method to address this is uh, using what's called a, some of you may, may be familiar with this, especially if you're you know, working in data science and so forth, is what's called a data warehouse. And that's where you can pool all these various UFO uh, data sources together, uh, even across various uh, different structures of data, whether it's uh, photographs, radar data, recordings. Uh, it's, I, don't, I don't see it up there, but as far as even text data, you know, if you have documents that you want to uh, uh, put into the data warehouse, and then you can catalog it. You can catalog it by physical characteristics of the object or phenomena. You can also characterize it by parapsychological or psychic uh, uh, characteristics, especially upon the observer. So, I just, um, I just real quick here, just like 
15 seconds, um, time's about up. But another thing is the, what the data warehouse is talking about is using a, um, a software platform like Hadoop, which is, uh, you can help, it's especially useful for working with structured data, and you can use that with the uh, data warehouse and with the catalog, with the, with the analytics sandbox, you can do all the descriptive and inferential st statistics, so. And that concludes my uh, presentation, so. Thank you for your interesting presentation. Are there questions? Yeah, thank you very much for an interesting talk. It's, uh, there's a ton of data, obviously, uh, and I'm, I think you can certainly uh, analyze it and, and benefit somewhat, but it seems to me, from what I've heard, it's the quality of the data that's the problem. Mm -hmm. So how do you get quality data? We have some radar data. You mentioned some uh, uh, psychological data. I think one of those that would be very interesting. But yeah. uh, what's being talked about is like spectrogram. The problem is if you have specialized equipment, where do you put it? How do you know when a UFO is going to appear? Mm -hmm. And so maybe by big data you can analyze if it, there truly are some hot spots where you might put rather expensive uh, equipment that can give you the kind of quality you need to do a much more thorough analysis. Yeah. Yeah, it's also not, not just the data itself, but the instrumentation. That, that could be a key factor. So. Any other questions? <clears throat> Yeah, Ross, I'm wondering, um, do you ha in the, you've thought about this a lot. Uh, what about the cases where it's inferred that there's something like a UFO there, but you don't have a direct sighting? You know, um, people who've reported, you know, lights coming down on their car, the car stalls, and all of a sudden they're missing four hours of time, or uh -huh. the vehicle is 20 miles away from where it should have been. Does that, isn't part of the problem here that we don't even know what exactly data is because we don't even know the r full range of the phenomena? What phenomena? We don't know the full range of the phenomena. I mean, we yeah. know what an object is that we can't mm -hmm. describe, but what about encounters where there's a lot of missing information, Yeah. and it's really at the border of what we even would you know, right. consider to be data. It just doesn't fit. That, that's where you can look at definitions, how, uh, how the data definitions are operationalized, and, and how you put, like what you're talking about, you, you can have a catalog for that kind of data no, especially if it needs more validation, you need to follow up and do additional follow up to clarify that special case like that, or it's more the more unique physical phenomena, psychic phenomena. So. Hi, uh, Hi, you know I'm really familiar with the concepts of data warehouse, and I think mm -hmm. it's a good idea to try to bring your data together mm -hmm. and make it accessible all one place. Uh, as someone was saying about cleaning up the data, that's a really good good point. One of the things that you didn't mention at all is metadata and adding uh -huh. additional fields, for example, like who collected the data right. or what type of instrumentation was used to collect the data. So then you can query across your entire database and see if you get consistent results from a single person or using a certain type of equipment. And that can give you more information that can help to make your data stronger and easier to analyze. Yeah. I agree. That's a valid point. So, Thank you very much for your interesting okay, that's presentation. It. Okay.